This is the R Podcast, Episode 8, Visualization with ggplot2. Hi everybody, this is Eric Nance and you're listening to another episode of the R Podcast. Thanks so much for joining us and in today's episode we're going to take a look via kind of a hands-on tutorial and demonstration of using one of the more powerful visualization packages with the R software called ggplot2. And in this episode, in addition to the audio content that you're listening to right now in our typical format, I will be releasing also the uh, second edition of the screencast and this particular screencast will contain the same audio as what you're hearing now in the main topic but it will also show via visualization of course what I'm doing with respect to the example I'll be talking through with ggplot2 and I'll be demonstrating that via the RStudio software and I'll also be showing some really helpful uh, sites to give you more references for learning more about ggplot2 itself. So before we get to our feedback for today's episode, I wanted to first send a really big thank you to the uh, folks at the Going Linux podcast. And the, the hosts of that are Larry, Tom, and Bill. And the reason I'm sending my big thanks to them is because they have been very kind enough to play a promo for the R podcast on their latest uh, Going Linux episode, which is number 174, which was a listener feedback episode. And I just want to say off the bat, I'm really glad these guys have taken the time to develop such a wonderful podcast. And they've actually been doing Going Linux for you know quite a quite a number of episodes, as you can tell by the number. And they have served as one of my main sources of inspiration for even launching the R podcast itself. And they actually had some really nice tutorials about a year or so ago on how to actually make a podcast using free and open source software such as, of course, Linux. And it was their tutorials and just the way they conduct their podcasts in general that really made me start to think that maybe I could pull this off too. So... Um, I've been emailing them back and forth just throughout maybe the past year or so. And when I finally launched this podcast and after I got my feet with a few episodes, I dropped them a line and see if they'd be kind enough to play a promo that actually is on the R Podcast site itself, which of course is uh, r-podcast.org. And if you go to the About page on the top menu, then you'll see a link to a little short promo that you can play right there on the site itself. And like I said, they're really kind enough to plug this podcast and they had some really nice words for me. And I just want to thank you guys again. If you're listening, Larry, Tom and Bill, great, great job on your podcast. And again, thanks a lot for being kind enough to plug the R podcast on, on your podcast. So the other um, piece of feedback I wanted to get to, or I should say announcement, is just that I really wanted to thank all of you that have signed up and posted some nice uh, content on the new forums. And I've already responded to a few of the posts on there, whether they were the uh, introduction you know, category where I've invited all of you listeners to just say a couple words about yourself and what you really enjoy about R. And also there was some nice uh, content directly about the latest episode, which was about using um, kind of the best practices for workflow for, you know, using R. And there were some really nice suggestions by a few of the listeners on some of the way they they use um, different, you know, techniques for their workflow as well. So I just wanted to thank all of you for signing up there. And if you haven't yet and you're interested, definitely check out the new forums and let me know what you think. And I'm really hoping that they could grow, you know, as as we get more listeners to the show and really have some nice discussions there. 
So with that, um, I think it's time to get to our pieces of listener feedback. Message for you, son. Okay, to lead off our listener feedback, I am very happy to say that we received our first audio comment. Um, the audio comment I'll play right now comes from Franz. Hey Eric, great podcast. I've listened to all the episodes and uh, learned uh, a lot of new things. Uh, heard your call for some audio feedback, so uh, here it is. Uh, my name is uh, Franz Slothauber and I've been using R for about four years now. I think mainly use it at uh, work. I work at the Dutch Railways and we built the software that uh, controls and authorizes the movement of uh, the trains. The software runs on uh, clusters of computers and we've been using R to analyze long-term performance measurements to uh, find deviations in the normal behavior and uh, visualize these uh, deviations so we can do uh, preventive maintenance on those systems. Uh, I have a background as a programmer and uh, hence my suggestion. I think uh, R is a very useful and powerful uh, language and system but uh, it also has uh, one or two pitfalls that uh, beginning users can easily fall into uh, without much warning so it might be a nice idea to devote an episode on this or maybe have a short segment in each episode where uh, one or two of these pitfalls are uh, explained and uh, it is told how to uh, avoid these pitfalls. Hey, keep up the good work and uh, have fun. Bye bye. Okay, Franz, thanks so much for supplying that. And I really, like I said, I really enjoy having the audio comment. And I mean, Franz did an excellent job with his recording quality and, you know, very, very good content. And to be more specific, I think. Um, along the same lines as what Franz suggested, that learning about what you could refer to as R's pitfalls or things that you may want to be aware of as you're beginning to learn the package are just as important as, say, a conventional tip on using R as well. And in fact, there's been some pretty uh, well-known examples about these uh, various pitfalls of using R and they've been documented very nicely by uh, Patrick Burns. And he's written a, a book, actually. It used to be just a simple report, but now it's a full-fledged book. But it's still available for free via PDF. And it's called The R Inferno. And it certainly has a, a humorous tone to some of the more kind of difficult issues you might face with R. And I'll include a link on today's show notes to get to that R Inferno, both the book and the PDF directly. And I think it's a very worthwhile read, especially as you begin to use R and you're kind of noticing some things that maybe are a bit difficult to get used to. But it also does a nice job of telling you the way R thinks about certain concepts and he does it from both kind of a statistical perspective and a programming perspective as well. And to Franz's point, I mean, I think I would be more than open to having, you know, audio content or listener tips that are just as much about things to be aware of with respect to R's pitfalls, as well as just, you know, the conventional type of tip, but maybe a, a set of code or just a general way that you've really benefited from your usage of R. So I definitely support keeping that coming along. And Franz, yeah, if you would like to, you know, sub, um, submit those on a regular basis, I am certainly fine with that. I would welcome that, actually. So once again, I'm just so happy we, we got an audio comment, and I hope it's just the, the first of many more. So next, we'll get to a couple pieces of the email feedback. And the first message, it comes from Todd. Todd says, Hi Eric, thank you for your advocacy of R. I heard you on another of my regular podcasts, maybe it was Floss Weekly or Going Linux, and immediately subscribed to the R podcast. Listening to episode 3 and looking at the companion material on GitHub, 
I decided then and there to try creating a histogram similar to the one that had taken me a messy, frustrating day to create in Excel. I was stunned by how quick, easy, and direct R was. Also, how clear and clean the graphical output was. Completely new to R, it took perhaps 10 minutes, including time to extract the data and perform a Google search for R statistics histogram. Who knows what we'll find as we visualize more data? Very exciting. I'm only on episode 3, but so far you have introduced R in an inviting way that's not overly technical. You and R have caused me to want to brush up on my college statistics. Thank you for your podcast and getting the word out. Well, that is just so awesome on a few different levels. Uh, thanks so much, Todd. And first, the one thing is you might sense, I could, I could kind of say that the going Linux effect has officially occurred. Um, that's definitely where you heard about us um, from the two that you mentioned. And once again, that's really nice that uh, Larry, Tom, and Bill got the word out about our podcast to their very um, wide audience. So that, that's just awesome right there. And second, I'm just really excited to see you, you know, get your hands with R and try a visualization. And now you you get a sense of really how much more optimal something like R is to create a visualization, in my opinion, of course, than uh, something like Microsoft Excel. So, and what you'll find is once you get the hang of things, you're going to be more than capable of creating some really cool visualizations and it's quite appropriate that we're, we got this comment now because you'll be hearing about the ggplot2 package in our main topic for today's episode, which you'll, you'll see we can do some really cool visualizations with that. So thanks so much, Todd. That just really makes my day to hear somebody, you know, listen to an episode of this podcast and then want to get to know R and actually try it out. That's, that's what I want. So thanks again. Our next piece of email comes from Hassan. Hassan writes, Eric, thanks for your wonderful podcast. I use R primarily to visualize spending. Hence, most of my R code exists as small scripts and are are run as batch jobs every few hours. It's a different use case than the one you outlined in your program. My workflow is as follows. First, convert data to CSV from whatever format it is. Second, read into R. Third, analyze and visualize, aka draw pretty pictures, as my former boss once described my job. I'm relatively new to R, and I have found the hashtag R-Finance channel on irc.freenode.net extremely helpful in my journey from someone who thought R was a pirate's cry to pointing the finger at R for causing the financial crisis in the first world. Hope this is helpful. Or just to say, hope this is useful. Well, thanks so much, Hassan. That was certainly a very entertaining way to end that that message. But um, yeah, that's certainly, you know, a very common workflow and it works for a lot of people that you'll get a data in a certain format and then just converting it to another format that's easily imported into R. And I've imported CSV files many times before. And then once we get it in there, then turn loose on doing any analysis and visualization. So I'm glad to hear that you've enjoyed the podcast and definitely hope you enjoy the remaining episodes as well. So that's going to conclude our listener feedback. It's time to dive right into visualization with ggplot2. Okay, so I've been really excited to get to visualization on the podcast, and I wanted to start actually with the ggplot2 package as opposed to the more uh, traditional approach that introductions usually take where they, you know, introduce how the generate plots in R via the base, you know, functionality, i.e. the plot function. And there are def- there's definitely opportunities, definitely in future episodes, that I'll likely visit that. But I had just been doing so much with ggplot2 lately, and combined with some nice enhancements that were just recently, you know, published that I've referred to already 
in previous episodes. I just wanted to dive right into this and really show you guys some really cool ideas for creating visualizations and really getting into the mindset of how ggplot2 does you know visualization so first i wanted to lead off with some background information um, as you've heard me mention before the ggplot2 package is developed by hadley wickham who is a professor of statistics at rice university and he is what some have referred to actually in other uh, blog posts as kind of the rock star of r itself in that he has generated a lot of buzz and a lot of excitement around the packages that he has developed. And arguably, I would, I would venture to say that ggplot2 is likely what he's most well known for, but he's also done some excellent other packages as well that in the course of future episodes we'll definitely be taking advantage of. And ggplot2 is actually, if you're wondering why does it have the two afterwards, well apparently there was a previous version of ggplot that I believe was around before I even got into R. And according to Hadley, I believe he just basically rebooted the package and built it up again and called it uh, ggplot2. And that's really what a lot of the usage has come from. And ggplot2 is the underlying you know functionality of this is based on what's called the uh, Grammar of Graphics by Leland Wilkinson. And what that really is, is kind of a, almost like a theory behind how you build a visualization through the concept of things like layering. And I'll get to that in a little bit. But on top of the Grammar of Graphics, uh, Hadley himself extended the philosophy of the Grammar of Graphics to be applied to R itself via, of course, the ggplot2 package. So here's, in my opinion, and just from what I've learned about the package, kind of the key idea around it. You know, I tend to describe the ggplot2 package as very similar to what you see in terms of those uh, photo editing softwares that a lot of people use. You know, the most well-known one is arguably Photoshop, you know, but there are actually some nice open source alternatives to that well i wouldn't be it wouldn't be right if i didn't mention that um one of them's called the gimp that's g-i-m-p it's actually a very nice open source clone to photoshop so if you're into that sort of thing i and you don't want to spend the, the relatively high cost of getting photoshop i i check out the gimp as well now i'll put a link in the show notes if you're curious but um back to the idea of ggplot2 I say it's a lot like those uh, photo editing, you know, packages because w when you import a photo into like those packages, you can do so many different things on top of this that raw image via the concept of what are called layers. So you and I've seen this actually demonstrated back when I was watching some nice uh, technology, you know, kind of uh, uh, episodes on a network that used to be called Tech TV, which they had a guy come in to really show some nice ways of photo editing via whatever, if it was Photoshop or others. But he would always use this concept of layers to really brush things up or enhance things. And it, it just would always build one piece on top of another on top of another, and then you had your finished product. Well, ggplot2 is very similar to this. Where, as you'll see once we get to our example for today, you'll start off by initializing a plot via the ggplot2 function, but then you'll see you add on top of that initialization uh, these different layers. And what you, what you really may want to know about these layers is that they have a few key components, first of which is appropriately the data i.e. what is the data you're trying to visualize. And then some the other key component are what are called aesthetic mappings between the variables from the data you're plotting and different traits that you want to give the visual. Those traits could include like color, size, shape, and other features like that. And speaking of shape, then another key component is what is going to be that type of shape. And they call these uh, geometric objects 
that show what is being visualized on the plot. So you can think of this as like if you want to visualize kind of averages across time on the x-axis for a certain response variable, you might do that via a line graph where you simply connect the points via lines. You might also have want to look at the distribution of data, like say using a histogram or a bar chart. You know, those are all these different geometric objects that we can utilize in the ggplot2 package. But all of these layers will have some kind of object that's representing that you will actually see on the finished product. And then an optional component that may be necessary for some of these geometric objects is a statistical transformation. For example, if, if you were interested in doing like a histogram, there will be, along with that geometric histogram part, the statistical function to bin your data into different intervals, which will make the different bars, if you will, on the histogram occur for your variable that you're trying to visualize. Well, other layers will have similar kind of statistical transformations, and those are also easily customized by the user as well. But ggplot2, the idea is that you build on top of your initial plot these different layers to actually see the data in the way that is most appropriate to you. And like I said, this, this, a lot of these concepts may not make a lot of sense just now, but I hope through the example I'm going to talk about that it will kind of you know, reinforce what these ideas are and make a little more sense. So recently, um, a very nice enhancement to the ggplot2 package occurred when it was upgraded to version 0 0.9. And I believe I introduced that in one of my kind of updates in the podcast a couple episodes ago. Well, this to me was an absolutely critical update because it introduced some really useful new features that will make the actual customization of a plot and its attributes a lot easier than perhaps it was before version 0.9. And it also introduced some new kind of these geometric objects that we can use as well. And I've been starting to play with those lately and you can really pull off some really cool visualizations with that. So I, like I said, I think this new upgrade and now they're up to version 0.9.1 actually, but I think it's an excellent time that if you're new to ggplot2, and you're new to visualization in general, that it's a great time to dive into it with this package because there have been some really cool enhancements done. Okay, so next I want to set up kind of the example that we're going to use in, in this uh, demonstration of ggplot2. And the type of data I'm going to use, I'm actually going to something that I've been really wanting to do for a very long time, um, now I'm going to be using actual um, data from the NHL or the National Hockey League. Um, just a bit of, you know, uh, intro to this. I've always been a very big hockey fan since, for growing up. And I, I just think as a just a fan standpoint, the sport is really exciting because you have such great kind of continuous action, really intense moments. And there's there's such a great feeling to see like a goal scored by your favorite team just it just is so cool to see um, so it's really always been one of my favorite sports to watch and then on putting on my other hat kind of my uh, analysis hat or statistics hat I think hockey in general might be actually one of the more challenging sports to really kind of analyze from a data analysis or a statistical point of view because Unlike baseball, where baseball, that sport is, you can really think of it as a set of discrete type events. Hockey is just more continuous in nature and so many things can occur in, during the game itself that I actually kind of enjoy having a challenge of really looking at that data effectively and seeing what we can you know, make out of it. So with that said, the data that I'm using today comes from a website called the Hockey Summary Project. And this started, um, apparently the author started this back in 2001, and it's one of the very few sites I have found that have actually put out 
some really easy to use hockey statistics. And I think it's really cool to see that. And, you know, I've actually looked for hockey stats for a very long time. And when, finally, I kind of saw this from one uh, another blog about, you know, sports statistics. And so I went ahead and signed up on their group and they have a group on this uh, Yahoo pages. And I'll put all the links to this in the show notes where they make available all these different regular season and playoff statistics going back all the way to 1917. And, you know, most of the years are covered here. There's a bit of a gap, I believe, in the in the 30s and the, up to the 50s. But once you get past that, they basically have everything here. So I really want to thank these guys for putting such a great resource online for kind of a, you know, a, a numbers guy like me to really take advantage of looking at these data in a, you know, easy to use format. So what I've done is I've downloaded all of these files and I have basically imported them into a, a big data frame and they have different types of data files. What I'm going to look at in today's episode is data about each game that's played in the regular season. And I'm going to be looking at, you know, somewhat recent years, but I, this told, this kind of brought to me, you know, an opportunity to really show off kind of how we can use a visualization package like ggplot2 to really get up to speed with this and see kind of what, what ggplot2 can do. So if you're watching on the screencast, you'll see that I've, I've put up the um, R Studio interface that I'll be showing this uh, plotting code with right now. And so I've actually utilized the project template package to kind of automate the uh, data cleaning and the uh, data loading that I had to do to get the data ready for this. So, but what's nice is once I do that once, it all runs very quickly. And what I'll be doing is after this, I record all this and I'll, I'll put um, all of the uh, content, the code that you'll see in the screencast and I'm talking about via the audio in our Git, one of our GitHub repositories. So you can definitely take a look, you know, after, our, after listening to this. So the, the first step in all of this is I wanted to get kind of the data subsetted to what I wanted to use for the visualization. And what I'm going to be interested in today is actually showing via ggplot2 and really kind of looking at the distributions of each game's kind of attendance numbers and attendance here meaning like what were the number of tickets sold for each particular game. And I'm, I'm interested in kind of looking at the distribution of all these kind of side by side via the different teams in the NHL. And of course, we're going to be doing this with the ggplot2 package. And the only things I'm really doing from a subsetting standpoint is I'm, for the purposes of today, I'm only going to look at the years of 1994 and, and up to today, uh, which is, of course, 2012. And one thing that the NHL has done recently is they've, on New Year's Day, they've held for the past few years now kind of an outdoor game at one of the uh, either a baseball stadium or a football stadium here in the U.S. And likewise, there's been a, a day in the year where two Canadian teams have played each other in one of the outdoor stadiums up in Canada as well. But what that does is because those stadiums are so much larger, they're kind of what I would consider huge outliers that might influence what I get from my distribution analysis. So I'm actually going to subset the data such that I'm only getting those games that had an attendance number less than 30,000, which, you know, obviously most of the NHL arenas won't even be close to that. So that's kind of a good way to, you know, filter out those other, you know, outdoor games just for the sake of today's um, tutorial here. So once I subset that, I'm going to call that object called plot.data and I'm actually going to use appropriate enough the subset function where all I'm feeding into it is my regular data frame for these games. I call it reg.game and I simply have as another argument the subset parameter and I have kind of a joint conditional of attendance being less than 30,000 and the year being greater than or equal to 1994. 
And so once I have that, now I have this data frame called plot.data, and that's gonna be everything I need to um, get up to speed with this, um, start with this analysis. So I'm actually gonna zoom in here um, on the screencast, so hopefully this will be more easily read than the, the last time we had this. Um, so the, next, the first step in the, the way we use uh, ggplot2 is to actually put uh, kind of initialize the plot itself. And so the way we do that um, is via appropriate enough the ggplot package. And what we do, or you know, of course we I should say we load the, the package verse via the library function which is, of course, library, and then we feed in the argument ggplot2. That's easily done. And then now I'm going to create kind of an object that will initialize the plot itself. And the way I'm going to do this is with the ggplot function. And what you need to know about this function is just a couple basic things. Is I'm interested, of course, the first argument being what kind of data you're going to put in as a visualization and you use appropriate enough the data argument. So here I'm gonna say data equal plot.data. That's simple enough. And then the next argument, I mentioned earlier in the episode about these aesthetics that you use to tell ggplot kind of what you wanna do with this data. So I'm gonna go ahead and start the, and initialize this via the AES function and this is within the ggplot function, of course. And the AES function will have different arguments for what you exactly want to put in as far as what do you want for your x variable, which will be, of course, on the bottom axis. And what do you want on your y, uh, what do you want to be your variable on the y axis? And then if you want to do things that differentiate, maybe use a variable to do different colors or different um, you know, other aesthetic details, that would go in here too. But what I'm only gonna do today is I'm gonna first declare that my x variable is going to be a, within the uh, data frame home.team, and then my y variable is going to be called attendance. So that's within this plot.data, I have in this the actual, you know, home team attendance and a bunch of other things as well and so i'm gonna then i can just close out with close parentheses so what i have here is i'm gonna call i'm gonna assign this to an object called my plot just something easy to remember so i've done my plot in the assignment operator ggplot and then the first argument data equal plot dot data and then aes x equal home dot team and y equal attendance and then just simply close all that out and then i'm just going to run that and then what you'll see is now in my lower pane here i have an object in in this um, values part of r studio i have an object called my plot and you'll see the type of that is actually a ggplot object and so you might be wondering, why did I need to assign it to an object right now? Well, what happens is, is that in ggplot, just using the ggplot function on its own is actually not the full story um, to get the plot actually visualized. What you need to, and I'll show you what happens, and I'll describe it on the audio, but if I just wanted to see this object, my plot, and run it, I get an error towards the bottom that says in the console saying there are no layers in the plot. So this is getting back to that concept I was talking about previously is that ggplot, in order to see things, you need to put layers on top of your initialization of the plot itself. So this my plot object is simply just initialization of you can think of it as like the canvas of a painting without anything on it yet. This is what we're gonna put it on and we're gonna use all these layers to do just that. So one thing that if you're curious about is you can use another, um, uh, uh, other, I should say another function 
called summary and you can actually use summary on a lot of different things in R and you can simply see what this my plot object is really representing in terms of ggplot2. So all I did of course is I, I used the summary function and the argument is simply my plot which is what I used as the object. And in the console what you'll see after executing that is we have a set of kind of values that are summarized here first of which is data and what you see there is actually all the column names of that data frame that I fed into that earlier uh, ggplot function. In this case you see about 21 columns here and about according to the data at the end there 18,000 rows just a little over that and then you'll see another section called mapping where it has x equal home dot team and y equal attendance so that was what I used in that AES function within the ggplot call because that is simply the default aesthetics that I'll be using that all of the future layers will build off of. And then that last line that you'll see is called faceting and it says facet underscore null and all that means is that I haven't done anything to split the plot up into different areas. You could think of it as like different parts of a grid and there, there will be a function that I, sh I talk about later on that will kind of you know separate the plot into different parts on the actual visual and that's usually called facets but anyway this object called my plot is now this in essence this blank canvas and the only thing it knows is the data where we want to plot and also the aesthetics of the x and the y variables that will be used in the plot itself so that that's just kind of something nice to kind of see under the hood of what ggplot's actually doing. So that, that's, that's all well and good, but now let's start adding layers to it. So what we want to do is, the way ggplot does these layers, is you basically add things on top of that initial ggplot call, or in this case, I've assigned that to an object called my plot. So all you really need to do to start this is you just do your object name and then a plus sign and what comes after this will be the layers that I add on top of this of this canvas if you will. So the type of visualization I'm going to be interested in today is side-by-side -side box plots and box plots are pretty useful um, just to get a sense of the distribution of your variable of interest and I want to compare this from team to team. So in, in ggplot2 I now have at my disposal all these different geometric objects or functions that we can use to develop this layer. And appropriate enough the way we do this box plot layer is using the function called geom underscore box plot. And so let's talk about after we put that function in, what are the arguments that we're going to need here? So the default, each of these layers will, these uh, geomes, which again are these kind of layers, um, you'll need aesthetics if you want to do anything in addition to the aesthetics that you've already specified in your original ggplot call. Here, I want to do one additional aesthetic that I didn't put on top because I want to color these box plots by what conference, either the Eastern Conference or the Western Conference, that these teams are coming from. So all I need to do there is, much like the ggplot function above, I have put in my um, ggplot or that geom box plot call, the AES function, and because I said I want these box plots to be filled by different colors based on conference, this aesthetic I'm interested in is called fill. So within the F-I-L-L. -L. So within this AES um, call, I'm going to say A -E AES parenthesis fill equal. And then now the variable that distinguishes what conference these teams are coming from. And I've already created that in the, in the original data frame it's going to be called home.conference. So this is saying to ggplot2 that okay my first layer is going to draw box plots 
with the x-axis being what I specified above, the home team, the y-axis being the attendance, but now filling the color of those based on another variable called home.conference. So once I have that in, then I can put in additional parameters that can kind of customize the way that the geom box plot layer is working. And one of those parameters is called width. And because I'm gonna be having multiple teams uh, represented here, I don't want the box plot to be so wide that they're really kind of scrunched on top of each other. So I'm gonna use a width parameter equal 0.3. And that's just the kind of unit scale that ggplot uses. Well, that's, you'll see that'll be a pretty good uh, value to use here. And then the other thing I want to tell this function is I don't really want to see the outliers on here because that might clutter the graph a little bit. So they have another argument called outlier.color. And they, for this, you have to be a little careful. I, they actually use kind of the British spelling of things like color. Although in some functions, you can get away with kind of the more typical spelling of C-L-L-O-R. But in this case, I looked up in the documentation, this argument's called outlier.color with the British spelling. But to say that I don't want in these outliers to be colored, I'm gonna assign the color in this argument to be NA, which in R is kind of the default way of saying to say set something as missing. So that's really all the arguments I'm interested in from the geom box plot function. So with that, I've finished up, I closed up the geom box plot call. And then when I run this, what you're gonna see is actually a, a first shot at this uh, ggplot to box plot. So here on the upper right quadrant in our studio, you'll see that I have now side-by-side -side box plots of all the teams on the x-axis and the attendance. And if you look into this graph closely, what you'll notice is that the home team, the x-axis, because all these team names are kind of long where they say like the city and then their kind of nickname, everything's kind of on top of each other, which makes it really hard to read which team is what. But on the y-axis, the attendance uh, axis, you'll see it goes from, it uses kind of, kind of intelligent defaults for the ranges of values. So it started from zero all the way to a little over 25,000, which isn't too bad. And then on the right part of the plot, you'll see kind of a, a little legend that's already been populated. The title of the legend is called home.conference and it has now the Eastern Conference teams assigned a reddish color, and then the Western Conference teams assigned a, a bluish color. So the nice thing about ggplot too is that it will make these legends for you automatically, which you know for someone like me, you know, saves a lot of work versus the traditional plot function in R, where you have to kind of code the legends yourself, yourself in a little bit. And to me, it sometimes isn't so trivial, although I've obviously seen some really good examples of it. But for me, the ggplot2 way of doing it makes it slightly easier. So like I said, now we have a plot that we could actually visualize and it showed up in our graphical window. But we have some things we wanna clean up on this and tweak a bit. So I'm doing this kind of in an interactive fashion and to be honest, I think Hadley, when he wrote ggplot2, he expected most users to use you know, ggplot2 as kind of in an interactive way of exploring your data and kind of building these visualizations kind of layer by layer in somewhat of an interactive fashion. Although what you'll see later on is we can wrap this all up in some nice kind of reproducible code once we get a visual we're really happy with. So my next step, um, I'm gonna do a, some different customizations to this current plot so that I would be happy with it if I was gonna say put this in some kind of publication or even just post it online somewhere. The first thing I wanna do is I would like to narrow the range of the y-axis a little bit. I would kinda of like to constrain it a little bit 
because it's very rare that you have games in which there are less than, say, 10,000 fans in attendance, although I've seen it happen before, but I'm more interested in the range of, say, 10,000 up to, let's call it 23,000. So when we do ggplot2 in this interactive fashion, there's a really nice kind of function it gives you by default, and they call it um, last dot or uh, last underscore plot because ggplot will save whatever your last actual visualization was in the memory. And you can actually use this in an interactive fashion to kind of build things up from what you previously plotted. So in this case, I'm going to type last underscore plot and then just do an empty arguments inside it. So open close parenthesis. And then I'm going to now put in another customization, much like how I did the first layer in the previous line of code. So I'm going to put in the plus sign again. And the way you can kind of, in essence, zoom in on a plot via specification of like a range of axis, you know, numbers, you use a function called chord underscore Cartesian. And this is actually very important to know if you want to zoom in on anything because there are a couple different ways I could accomplish this, but the chord underscore Cartesian function will ensure that I haven't chopped off any data points that are outside of the range that I'm specifying here. And because I'm saying that because you could also use another function called like scale underscore X or Y underscore continuous. And you could put in your limits of the axis you're interested in within that particular function. But don't do that if you just wanna zoom in on a plot because that will actually eliminate any other data points you have that are above or below the range you specify, which will obviously influence any calculations in the statistical functions that ggplot2 uses for whatever geome you're visualizing. So in this case, like I said, I'm gonna use the chord underscore Cartesian function. I'm gonna feed in just a couple, one argument actually called ylim, so y-l-i-m, and then I'm gonna say that's equal to a simple numeric vector with two numbers. In this case, the first number is the lower part of the range, so I want 10,000. And then comma, I'm gonna feed in the highest part, which is 23,000. Then I just close that, that uh, call up, and then now I'm gonna run this specific line, much like how I did before. And then what you'll notice then is in the plot itself, I'm gonna zoom into it here, you'll see that now the attendance is now narrowed on the y-axis from 10,000 to it has a tick at 22,000, but the top of that graph would be you know, right at 23,000. So now I'm starting to see a zoom in view via the y-axis on the attendance figures. So that looks like some, I'm getting you know closer to what I want. And so I got a couple more customizations left that I want to do to get this kind of ready to be, you know, really assessed visually. The next customization I want to do is by default, ggplot2 will use kind of as a background this light gray with white lines kind of dividing, in essence, the ticks of the X and Y axis on the background itself. And most of the time that's fine. But if for me, I'm kind of used to having more of a white background with like a darker line for all these kind of kind of axis breaks, if you will. But the nice thing is, is once again, there's a very simple function to just get that kind of whitish background. And that function is going to be called theme underscore BW. And so in order to do this on top of what I've already done, once again, I'm going to call that function called last underscore plot which will have everything I've done up to this point in memory. And then I'm gonna do a plus sign and then do the function theme underscore BW, again with no arguments, just an open close parenthesis. And what that will do is when I run that, the plot background has now changed. 
Now, instead of having the gray background with white lines you know, behind, it now has a white background with grayer lines to denote where those axis points are. So this is obviously more of a visual thing for me personally, but it's nice to know that ggplot gives you that functionality to kind of switch between those two built-in themes. The default theme is that, I think they call it a theme grayscale or something similar to that. But I tend to like the theme BW just because if I wanted to show this off to other people, I think it's just a little more visually pleasing. But like I said, it's kind of a subjective thing, you know, depending on what you really like in your plots. So now I've got that customization on, out of the way. I got a couple more to go. Um, the first of which is now you notice that my labels on the X and Y axis say home.team and attendance respectively which may be fine for you know general purpose but I'd like to give those labels a little more verbose kind of a little more uh, maybe cleaner kind of you know font or you know it's just say text so as of ggplot2 version 0.9 or maybe it was in there before I don't recall but there's a nice function that we can use to just control the labels of these different aesthetics called the labs function so let's talk about how we do that. Um, first of which is we're going to simply, once again, call the last underscore plot function um, to get where we left off. And I'm going to add now, via the plus sign, another function called labs. And this one I am going to put some arguments with because they're going to correspond to the different aesthetics I put on this plot itself. So the first aesthetic is going to be appropriate enough X. And I'm going to call that, instead of saying home.team, I'm just going to call it team. And I'm going to call it a capital T just to make it a little cleaner. And for the Y axis, I'll actually use the same, the same word, but I'm just going to capitalize it. So I'm going to say Y equal and then attendance with a capital A. Now that covers the X and Y, but we can also control what the legend will use via its labeling as well. And to do that, I'm going to use the aesthetic called fill, F-I-L-L, -L, because that's what I put in that box plot call, the geom underscore box plot function, for the aesthetic for coloring based on conference. Now, by default, it gave a label the same as the variable name, which was home.conference. Here, I'm just going to say fill equal and then conference. And that should take care of the way the legend is labeled in the actual legend part of the plot. So let's go ahead and run this. And then what you'll see then is after you've done this, now the um, plot itself has different labels on the X, the Y, and the legend part of the plot. They're exactly as I specified in the labs function. So now we're, we're really close now, but it, if you notice, I've been saving something for last, and that's cleaning up all these team names that you see on the x-axis where they're all kind of scrunched together. Obviously, I can't read anything about that. So the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to use, um, uh, I believe, a relatively newer function in ggplot2 that will take care of all these details via these options and that function is called OPTS and like I said maybe this was in there before but I've only learned recently how you can really use this to get to what I'm looking for so I'm gonna I'm gonna in essence cheat a little bit here because I'm just going to copy all that from another file and then put that into this R script that I'm, I'm showing right now but let me verbally describe what I what I've done here I've again used the uh, let's see that's the wrong button let me uh, go here okay so I've used the uh, last dot plot you know function again like before and now I've used the function called OPTS this is ggplot2's global function for controlling all these different options within the plot itself so first I'm not gonna, I'll, I'll tell you what all these are, but then I'd invite you to look at the, the code file if you want a lot more details. But 
I'm going to specify within this ops function the title of the plot, which will appear at the very top. I'm going to call that distributions of game attendance. So that was with the title argument. Next, there is another argument called plot.title, which may be a little redundant if you think, I've already done the title, why do I need this? Well, these, these versions of these title type options will let you control things like how big the font is, the style of the font, the orientation, etc. And within, to do that, you assign as an argument to this plot.title object an, a function called theme underscore text. And within that theme underscore text function, you can control a lot of different things. In this case, I'm going to say size equal 20. So now I just said, okay, make that title I just specified for the plot a font with size 20. So next I have a couple arguments to denote things about the position of and also aesthetics about the legend itself. Now, by default, the legends always appear kind of on the right side of your plot, kind of in a separate pane, if you will. But you can also tweak where you put that, and you do that via an argument called legend.position. And in this case, I'm going to say I want that at the very top, right under the title. So all you feed in as the value for that is a character string saying top. I could have done like bottom, left, right, you know, all, and even within the plot itself via different coordinates. But for today, I'm just going to put it at the top. Next, I have an argument for legend.title. This will be just like that plot.title argument, but now I'm going to use, now once again, the theme underscore text function as its value, and within that, give it another um, argument for size. I'm going to say that equal to 20 as well. So that was the title of the legend. Now within the legend itself, you saw it broke up, you know, it had text for like east and west, and I'm going to give that size a little boost too via the legend.text argument. And again, what I'm assigning to that is the theme underscore text function. And I'm going to give that font an argument of size equal 12. So a little smaller, but it should be more readable. Now the, the most important parts that I'm doing this are for the axes themselves, where I want the team labels instead of being all kind of on top of each other in a horizontal way, I want to make it so each team label is on a vertical orientation so that we can easily distinguish what team is what. And we can do that with the axis.text.x argument. This is all within that opts of function. And I'm going to say that, again, equal to theme underscore text, Parenthesis. Now I'm going to give an argument called angle equal 90, i.e. to flip those labels 90 degrees. So that will help a lot. And I'm going to give it a boost in the size and say size equal 12. So basically everything else in this OPTS call that I have follows a similar way. And I'm just customizing certain things about the aesthetics themselves. And so once I, I'm finished with that, and then I go ahead and run all this, and again, it's the last underscore plot, and then plus this OPTS, and then all these different arguments inside. Once I do that, then you're gonna notice that the plot looks a heck of a lot better now. And so I'm gonna zoom in on it and describe to you what, what we've done here. What we've done here is what you'll notice is now the team, the x-axis, all the teams are on a, the names are vertically oriented and they're a bigger font. So we can clearly see that the left one is the Anaheim Ducks and the very right is the uh, Winnipeg Jets. And so now I've also um, done some customizations to the font size of the title as well as the title itself distributions of game attendance, and then you'll see under the title, I have conference and then those colors for east and west. So now the legend went from the very right to now right under the title of the graph. So that to me gives me a little more real estate, if you will, of the plot area. And so now this is at the point where I can actually start looking at this and discern what is what here. And so 
a couple trends that I'll describe to all of you that I noticed kind of right off the bat. Um, one thing I've noticed is that obviously there's a lot of variation from team to team. But I think um, to tell the full story and what I'm really interested in is I want to see how the attendance figures compare between the years that I've collected before the NHL lockout occurred in 2004, where basically the whole league shut down for a year because there was a dispute between the players and the owners on various issues, and the attendance figures after the lockout ended, which was a full year later. I think that would be quite interesting to visualize. So I'm going to go ahead and close then the zoom of this, and I'm going to add onto this last stop plot again a new function that I think is really um, powerful here to do this kind of layering, if you will. And that function is going to be called um, facet underscore grid. So I'm doing, again, last underscore plot because it'll have everything I've done up to this point. And then plus, now I'm going to call facet underscore grid. And what this is going to do is that it's going to partition the graph into two different or actually multiple areas depending on another variable. So in this case, the way you do this is via what they call kind of a formula interface, where in this case, I have a variable called era.ind, which basically gives for each game whether it occurred before the lockout or afterwards. And then, so that's my first stuff that I've typed in here. Now I'm going to type a tilde sign. And if I wanted to do another variable to split them up even more, I would put that to the right of the tilde. But in this case, I don't need to do that. I'm just interested in what these, what's the difference between these two different eras that I've called it. So to do that, you just put in to the right of the tilde a period, which means just use the rest of the data as it is. And so there's only one other argument that I'm interested in here. So after I've done this formula specification, I'm doing a comma with margins equal false. The reason I'm doing this is that I don't need to see the both eras put back together as a separate facet in all this. I'm just interested in the two facets of before the lockout and afterwards. So once I type all this in and then I run this, and of course, if you're watching on the screen, I mistyped facet. I did face underscore grid, which could be a really wild function. But anyway, it's supposed to be facet underscore grid. So I run that. This should hopefully get me what I'm looking for. And it does, actually. So I'm going to zoom into the plot and describe to you what I'm seeing. What I'm seeing now is I have, on the very right, now I have two partitions basically horizontal partitions of these, these box plots. The upper quadrant has on the right some text that say post-lockout. So this is the attendance distributions for all the games that occurred after 2004, i.e. after the lockout. The bottom partition, the lower half, is pre-lockout. So this would be all the years from 1994 to up to 2004 that I subsetted, you know, in my earlier call to get the plot data. This is what I was most interested in because I want to see when you go from the different part times in the history, the recent history, I should say, what's the difference along all these attendance figures? A couple of things immediately jump out. You'll notice um, for some teams, the box plots are almost like little horizontal ticks even on this plot itself. You know what that means is that means that all the tickets sold for that team were basically what we call sellouts, i.e. all the tickets were sold. And full disclosure, my favorite team on this is um, the Detroit Red Wings. And you'll see that both the pre-lockout and the post-lockout, compared to the rest of the box plots, it's really just this little horizontal tick, i.e. there's very little variability in the attendance figures maybe slightly more in the pre-lockout, but not by much, where it's right around 20,000. So I know from growing up, you know, especially before the lockout, they would always sell out. Now, I'll go off on a little tangent here. I said tickets sold, 
And I know from what I've seen that after the lockout, because of the economy in the United States, especially in Michigan, that the Red Wings would have trouble selling out some of the games in the regular season in recent years. So I may want to look into this a little more carefully because I don't think I'm getting the full representation of this via the attendance numbers. But anyway, enough of that tangent. Um, the other parts I notice is that some teams had quite a boost in attendance after the lockout ended compared to before. A team I'm looking at right now is um, actually the Carolina Hurricanes, where their box plot showed you know, a lot of variability or spread anywhere from low, a little lower than 10,000 to a little under 16. And then that's before pre-lockout. And then after the lockout, the distribution via the box plot really kind of tightened up, you know, much more so anywhere between about a little less than 15,000 to a little over 18,000. And that makes a little more sense also because I believe they won a championship after the lockout as well. So, and then there are other teams that also had this kind of big boost after the lockout as opposed to before. One of them is the uh, Buffalo Sabres, located in Buffalo, New York, who had a lot of variability in their attendance, you know, before the lockout occurred. And then afterwards, they have really sold out very well, where now it's just that very tiny box plot, you know, right around, say, a little over 18,000. So they definitely have come a long way. And you can see similar trends, sometimes even the opposite way for some teams as well. But it was just interesting now that I have actual hockey data to really analyze and visually see this. And I've done it all in ggplot2 with a relatively small amount of coding. And to me, it's appeared quite logical. So you've seen that in an interactive fashion, we have now gotten a really nice publication quality plot. Now, I've, I've pretty much settled on the way I constructed it. What if I want to kind of reproduce this later on? Well, the, what you can do, it's a nice little trick, is that in ggplot, you can actually make objects out of these actual layers that I put on top of the kind of the base plot itself. And so what you'll see, and then when you access the code, you know, after this podcast on the show notes is, um, let me uh, first zoom out there. Um, I'm going to actually copy in, if you're watching on the screencast, some really interesting set of code that actually does what I've just described. So what I've done is I've now made objects out of various kind of layers that I put as I kept calling like last underscore plot plus and stuff and those different layers I put after the plus sign, I'm making those now little objects. So I have like my plot dot labs, I've assigned that object, that labs call that I did that defined the label text. I've also done one called my plot dot theme, which is taking a list of all those different kind of theming components that I had versus whether it was the theme BW call or all those options that I did for like the the font size, the orientation, etc. I've also done a layer or object called myplot.zoom, which it contained that chord underscore Cartesian call that would zoom in on the y axis. And lastly, I did a myplot.box object, which had the layer for actually getting the box plot on in the first place. So that was very straightforward. I just assigned all those different objects. So what the the nice thing you can do with all this is you can now use those layers that you've created as objects in very simplified calls of into ggplot2 to create your graph. So I'm going to start with a clean slate. I'm going to clear the graphs that I've done up to this point and I'm going to, you know, copy in some more code that actually does this just for the sake of, you know, ease of, of time here. I'm going to start off like I did before, right? Kind of what I call put the canvas up, where I assign an object called my plot, the ggplot call with the data and the two aesthetics for X and Y that I'm going to start with. So that's just like before. I'm running that. 
But now what I can do is now I can add on top of my plot all these different objects I've done for those different options or, or I should say those different layers and I'm doing it in the same order that I kind of built things off of. But then once, and it's really simply my plot plus, and now my plot dot box plus my plot dot zoom plus my plot dot labs. And it's all in one line, etc. And then when I run that, I'm actually, and again, once again, I've, uh, I mistyped something here. Um, could not find my plot dot. Oh, I know what I did. I didn't. I didn't execute all these objects being saved. Uh, that's. Let me do that real quick, and then uh, run this. That's the beauty of doing this live. Sometimes you forget to do certain steps. Okay. So once I do this, and then I run now that line where I kind of called everything on top of my plot. You'll see now I have that same exact plot that I did. Apparently I have to, I forgot to do the label of the X axis, but that's okay. Um, in fact, now I see the problem. I think I've run the wrong thing here, but um, yeah, I see what happened. I did the wrong uh, label for the Y axis in, in my call to all this. So I'm gonna fix that on the fly here. Forgive me folks, that, that wasn't supposed to be um, done here. So I'm going to kind of recreate what I did before where I called x equal quote team in the labs function. Um, sorry about that guys. And then I'm going to rerun all these objects again and I'm going to get what I intended to get right off the bat. Must have been a copy paste issue. Yeah, that's what I'm looking for. Okay. So all I did again is I saved all those layers as different objects in R. And then when I built that plot via the ggplot2 call and I save that to a my plot object, I just simply added all those layer objects on top of my plot and I got the same graph that I got before. And so that in a nutshell is how you can reproduce things in ggplot2 so that now that you've found the type of visual you want, you can go ahead and save and save these different layers or even, you know, like I did before, I saved kind of what I call the, the base call of it. And you can really tweak certain things and only have to tweak it in one place. And you could change this up. You could do something different for the Y axis. It would only need a couple different tweaks and then you could run basically the same code. So I really like the flexibility that ggplot2 offers when it comes to visualization. So we, we spent quite a bit of time going through this example and and I must say, I've only scratched the surface of what ggplot can do. I've done these kind of side-by-side -side box plots, faceted by another variable and then colored by another. But there are so many other visualizations you can do. And I wouldn't be surprised that in future episodes, we do kind of a more advanced look at ggplot too as well. So I'm going to close off this episode with some really great resources that I've found for you know learning ggplot2 and understanding how it works you know i i think the best way to learn is to learn via example and that's why i went through this example in great detail to hopefully show all of you the great capabilities of what this what ggplot2 can do so the first resource i want to mention is actually something that we had a uh, some listener feedback about from charles back a, about an episode or two ago and there's a nice website by uh, Winston Chang called the R Cookbook. And this, this is really nice because on top of some of the basics about R that uh, Winston talks about, he has excellent sections on ggplot2. So like I said, I'll have all these links in the show notes, but I would highly suggest looking at all of his examples for graphs with ggplot2 because he does in a very nice, easy to understand way. To be honest, probably even easier to understand what I just did, but it's really nice to have as a reference if you wanna do more with, and kinda of get started with ggplot2. And there's one type in particular that I use to this day, is the plotting means and error bars tutorial that he has. It's a really nice application of summarizing your data via summary statistics and then putting that in the ggplot2. It is an excellent tutorial, and I highly recommend this site. 
The other site actually is appropriate enough, the uh, home site for the ggplot package, or actually ggplot2, and that's been constructed by Hadley Wickham himself. It's um, The link is had.co.nz forward slash ggplot2. And what's nice about this is it's kind of like a visual help page an example database for what ggplot2 can do. And I believe this has been built for quite a while and I don't believe it's been updated since the recent update to ggplot, but it has some excellent examples of the basics and all these different geomes or geometric objects that I talked about. And for example, of course he has one for box plots. So if you're wanting to do more box plots on top of what I've showed you, I would check this out as well and then you'll see you know once you click on these links you'll see that in the example section he visually produces all these different calls to ggplot and there's a lot of cool things you can get just from browsing this uh, particular site so uh, that's another one you'll definitely want to put in your bookmarks uh, some others before I before I close up shop here um, on github Hadley has produced the ggplot2 wiki page where it has some really cool you know kind of verbal this or I should say more verbose descriptions on you know ggplot2 around the web some FAQs and some good examples he calls them case studies from I believe dating to 2010 where they have used ggplot2 in a real application whether it was you know a report or a post online or you know whatever have you He's done some really cool summaries here, so I would check that out if you're interested as well. As far as getting help with ggplot2, there's of course one way you could do it is you could search on the site called stackoverflow.com, which I mentioned is kind of like the, the nice Q&A forum for all things about R when you put the tag R in your query. Well, on top of that, there is the actual ggplot2 group on Google Groups, so it's basically a mailing list where it has a bunch of questions about ggplot2 that are answered by a lot of users out there who are definitely more, more of an expert than I am in this package, but there's some really good stuff here. If you have a question, I would suggest, you know, looking at this group and at least searching there, and, you know, if you're more interested in even joining the group, so that if you have, you have an answer to offer to somebody, I would go ahead and, uh, sign up on that and see see what you can do. Um, so that, that covers a, kind of a mailing list type setup for ggplot2. There's another site that I just heard about recently. It's actually, I would consider an aggregator blog for a lot of ggplot content online. It's called blog.ggplot2.org. And I, I literally learned about this about a week ago and it has some really good posts that the contributor, the contributing authors have found that mention ggplot2 or demonstrate ggplot2 in some way. So I just, you know, subscribed to this via my Google Reader, and I've already found some really cool content on here with examples and other tutorials about ggplot2 that I wish I had even a while back. There, there's some really good stuff here. Um, lastly, just a few more sites I'll mention. Um, there's been a blog called Learning R, and what the author of this blog has done is he's actually replicated a bunch of graphs that were in a textbook called Lattice, Multivariate Data Visualization with R. And he's done a series of posts of basically replicating all those plots that were done via the lattice package and he's done them with ggplot2. I, I actually learned about this quite a while ago and I thought it was just fascinating to see all these different examples of plots with ggplot2 and it gave me a lot of good ideas to pursue further and I think he's done an excellent job of of course putting the code from both the lattice version of a graph and also the ggplot2 version of a graph and he puts them, you know, basically side by side, the actual plots themselves. And you can see the differences and compare and contrast between these two powerful visualization packages. So I would definitely recommend checking that out as well. Um, two hours before I sign off here, 
First of which, there is a great application of ggplot2 to produce what are called Kaplan-Meier survival curves, which those of you who have had statistics and know about something called time to event analysis or called survival analysis. Um, this blog called Matt's Stats and Stuff, he's done a really nice example of visualizing a Kaplan-Meier survival plot and then putting on the bottom frequencies on what, how many, like in this case, like patients or, or subjects that are at risk in each of these time points. And I just was really interested in this because I had never seen this done in ggplot2 before, before I got wind of this blog. And he's really done a nice job of creating a function that does everything he, that you would want in this analysis. So it just kind of is a nice illustration of what you can do with ggplot2 to customize it to your actual analysis needs. And I've actually used it actually in some actual projects and I got a really nice visual out of it. And I could, you know, still stay in my comfort zone of using ggplot2 instead of having to go back to another part of the visualization techniques in R. I could do it all within this. So I just thought it was a really interesting, you know, example of extending ggplot2. Before The last one before I close up here is one that I got from that kind of ggplot2 aggregator blog. And... I think the, the name is in French. I'll, I'll probably butcher it, but I'll, it's like code a la mode. And I'll have a link to it in the show notes. But the authors or author of this, he has done a series of plot of posts about using ggplot2 via specific examples and even also a nice tutorial as well. So I've, I just bookmarked this when I discovered it because I mean, I think once again, the best way to learn is through example. And he's got some really nice examples here that I think are actual a nice companion to the R cookbook and, of course, the uh, ggplot you know, website as well. So I, I've, I've talked about all these because I think all of these are really instrumental and helpful in learning about ggplot too. And actually, I almost forgot one thing as well, is that when ggplot2 was upgraded to 0.9, there was a nice document that was produced by the development team to talk about all the changes and additions to ggplot2.9 as opposed to what was in the previous version. And on top of the technical details, it has some really cool examples of some of the newer functionality that ggplot2 is offering as opposed to the, late, to the earlier um, versions of the package. And I've used this extensively because there are some really cool you know, geomes that they've, you know, constructed now. One's called like geom underscore violin, where it's kind of showing a different way of viewing the distribution of data. And I started to play with this recently in some projects, and I think I really like what it's doing. So I will, I'll have a link to this uh, PDF in the show notes. And so if you have experience with ggplot2 and you wonder what's new with the, with the new package version, I would check this out because it really gives a nice breakdown of what's new and what's changed. So on top of that, I'll close by saying that if you're really interested in more of the theory behind ggplot2, I would recommend you know purchasing the book by Hadley Wickham, and it's called uh, ggplot2, Elegant Graphics for Data Analysis. And I'm actually going to search for it on the screencast here because I forgot to open the link. Um, um, on my uh, browser here. So I'm just going to show you quickly what it looks like. Um, you can find it on all the retailers like Amazon, etc. But I bought this about a couple years ago and it really was nice just to kind of see behind the scenes how ggplot2 works on a kind of a theoretical level. But I would say, you know, to really appreciate the material here, I think it's helpful to even start with some of these online tutorials first because that will kind of introduce these concepts. And then what Hadley's done is he's really put a lot more details and what is the motivation behind certain things and how you can really customize ggplot2 even more than what's offered by default. But I think to become a true master with ggplot2, I think it's worthwhile to get the textbook as well. But you know, depending on how far you want to go with it, 
you know, like I said, I would highly recommend it just because for me, I'm kind of sticking with ggplot2 for most of my visuals now. So I would still recommend that to a textbook if you really want to take it to a next level. If you're doing this on a routine basis and you really want some powerful visualization. So yeah, I think that this uh, very uh, seemed like a very long tutorial. I think we're going to wrap this up now. Um, but I've really enjoyed kind of showing off ggplot2. And um, I hope you see just how powerful the package is. So I'll close with, of course, talking about where you can get some more information. Of course, um, all the show notes for today and the past episodes will be on our home site of www.r-podcast.org. And of course, you'll see the RSS feeds for the audio uh, podcast as well as the upcoming screencast that I've recorded as well. We also, as I mentioned, we have the brand new R Podcast forums, and you can find those at r-podcast.org slash forums. We also are on Google+, and I have a link um, directly on the home site, and that the short link to that is goplus.us forward slash R Podcast. Lastly, we will have show updates announced on our Twitter account, and that's at the Rcast. So, with that, I think we're ready to wrap this episode up. Thanks a lot for listening, everybody. And until next time... End of line.